With the Xbox One Series X and the PS5 on the horizon, we're already starting to get excited about hot new launch titles, like maybe Biomutant. And I guess Gears of War 5? Did that not come out already? Is the band back together then? Should I take a picture for your scrapbooks? But although the launch lineups for the next generation of consoles might not seem super exciting just yet, things could always be worse. Take, for example, these seven games that ideally, rather than being launched alongside consoles, would instead be launched into the sun so we never have to play or think about them ever again. Enjoy! That stupid cow. Every night she jumps over the moon and dances in my cornfield. I can't sleep at night. Shrek, do me a favor and pass some gas on her when she's out dancing. That'll teach her a lesson. I'm on my way, Shrek exclaimed. Lest we forget, the early noughties were plagued by shoddy movie tie-in games that took your enjoyable cinema experience and said, hey, wouldn't you like to experience that again but at home for more money with worse graphics and none of the original actors? I know, what a great deal. A great deal of sadness. The year 2001, for example, hailed the arrival of both Microsoft's original Xbox and the DreamWorks CGI comedy Shrek, so a banner year for great big ugly green things. No shade though, because the original Xbox was a groundbreaking console, and the original Shrek gave us what Mike Myers confidently assured us was a fine Scottish accent. Thank you very much. I'm here till Thursday. Where these two icons came together, however, is where the problem occurred. And that problem was Shrek the game. Shrek, something terrible has happened. Of course, we all remember the movie ends with the wedding of Shrek and Princess Fiona, accompanied by a deeply moving Smash Mouth soundtrack that we cannot and will not reproduce here. The game picks up right after that, revealing that Princess Fiona was then immediately kidnapped by a heretofore unknown magical supervillain. Merlin has captured Princess Fiona. But you can rescue her by going on a quest! So instead of enjoying his swamp honeymoon, Shrek must venture forth and complete a bunch of quests. By which I mean, scurry around lamping fairy tale creatures with his rock'em sock'em punching arms. The action felt loose and disconnected, the levels were pokey and unpolished, and in place of blockbuster production value and celebrity voice acting, there were buckets of jank and no voice acting. Except for the magical storybook of exposition because it's cheaper than cutscenes. The gingerbread man anxiously hobbled over to Shrek. Shrek, he shrieked, am I glad to see you? So went Shrek's mission to retrieve his bride, doing good deeds like capturing evil fairies fighting vampire bats, and farting on a cow for humour reasons. Let this serve as a stern warning against a return to the dark days of movie tie-in games. Eternal vigilance is the price of freedom from this whole deal. Have you ever asked yourself, how good of a fighter am I? Would my best friend be able to pound me in a street fight? Or simply if you've ever felt the urge to punch someone in the face? <laughs> and a fighter within is the game for you. Do you remember Kinect? It was a kind of ominous black oblong you plugged into your Xbox that was constantly tracking your skeleton and could read your pulse by using infrared beams to look at your blood. So weird it wasn't more popular. The original Kinect was for the Xbox 360, but its successor, the upgraded Kinect 2.0, was intended to be a major part of the Xbox One system. We're bringing a new Kinect sensor paired with every Xbox One, which puts you at the center of your entertainment. As such, the Xbox One needed Kinect-only video games in order to make the prospect of having an always-on surveillance device in your living room that was constantly scrutinizing your family's bones sound like, you know, fun. So you can see right away the things that can only be done with Natal. Enter Fighter Within from Ubisoft, a one-on-one -on -one fighting game with a cast of tough and flamboyant characters, an arsenal of bone-crunching martial arts moves, and one of the worst control systems in video game history. The power of the new Kinect turns the promise of motion fighting into a reality. It's revolutionary! Or, okay, sure, revolutionary. To really make the case for Kinect, Fighter Within was designed to be controlled entirely by motion. In theory, that meant when you throw a punch, your character will throw a corresponding punch in the game, as we can see from the trailers, that seem to be pitching the game as the perfect way to work out the murderous rage we apparently all feel towards our closest friends. Hate your friends, you ringtone. Laugh 
guessing how the movie ends? Bickering about the best supervillain. Maybe that's just the people who worked on Fighter Within. In practice, as anyone who's ever played a motion control game will tell you, this meant flailing wildly around in your living room while something almost entirely unrelated happens on the screen, sometimes involving punches, <laughs> sometimes involving kicks, and sometimes involving you stopping playing Fighter Within, unplugging the Kinect, and burying it in a lead-lined box somewhere where it couldn't see your blood anymore. Mostly that last one, if I'm honest. August 16, 2038. International Peacekeeping Force Headquarters, Auckland. Control picks up an urgent message from undercover agent Franco Fukuzawa at the South Pole Observation Base of the giant Bifloss Group. The message reads, Situation critical. Kim must be stopped. Repeat, Kim must be stopped. In 1995, the Sony PlayStation's newfangled ability to throw textured polygons around the screen like confetti at a wedding brought with it the promise of true 3D first-person shooters. Launch window title Killeek, the DNA imperative, was the first one to the party. And like the first one to show up at a party, it was tragically uncool. Forget the varied environments and fast-paced action of Doom, which would land on PS1 several months later, or 1999's Medal of Honor, which was arguably the console's most technically advanced FPS. Instead, Killeek the DNA Imperative was a slow and repetitive shooter that seemed to take place in an unending network of boring corridors, like setting a game in Terminal 4 at LAX. What's imperative is that you don't play this game. We're not sure whether the story, which sees you piloting a lumbering mech suit, was the plan from the beginning, or whether it was retrofitted in to help excuse the clumsy controls, which were about as responsive as me napping after a burrito. Speaking of the plot, it's completely bananas. Eventually it's revealed that Killeek of the title refers to an ancient extraterrestrial that, implausibly, is the common ancestor for everyone on Earth, but whose DNA turns people into giant gross insects? You may have won the day's battle, but now you will see my real powers. My empire shall be ravaged no further! So I'm supposed to believe I'm related to this? Actually, on second thought, that does look a bit like my Uncle Steve. I think it's the eyes. Tony Hawk is pretty cute for an older ex-skater. He's not that old, and he's not an ex-skater either. <laughs> but you do think he's cute, huh? You didn't say he wasn't cute. Oh, you're so in love with Tony Hawk? LOL! The Tony Hawk's Pro Skater series is on my Mount Rushmore of beloved game franchises. It's probably the Roosevelt, maybe even the Lincoln, on a good day. <laughs> so when I heard there was going to be a Tony Hawk game in the launch lineup for the Nintendo Wii, I was optimistic. And then I played it. And then I was sad. And have you ever tried being sad on a skateboard? It's almost impossible. Woo! Thank you! The game in question was Tony Hawk's Downhill Jam. And I know what you're thinking. This is a Wii game, and here comes yet another rant about how motion controls suck. Would that it were, friends. Would that it were. In fact, it's because Tony Hawk's Downhill Jam was a racing game. Gone was the trick-based, combo-centric, exploration-heavy gameplay of the main games in the Tony Hawk series, and in its place, we got Tony and pals careening helplessly down hills in what looked remarkably like footage from a PSA about the dangers of skateboarding. You know, I left my kidney in San Francisco. Don't you mean your heart? No, I do mean my kidney. It was back in 99. They were never able to find it. Sure, you could still trick off things and grind rails, but with the relentless pace and the way the Wiimote controller has only two buttons, meaning there's a lot of doubling up of commands, and the fact that you're trying to steer by tilting the Wiimote, doing anything with precision is going to be tricky as you pinball off walls and railings, barely in control of what's going on. Okay, there was some moaning about the controls. Tick that off if you had it on your bingo card. 
Much of the joy of Tony Hawk games lies in the exploration of the various open world levels, and Tony Hawk's Downhill Jam not only took all the exploratory fun out of the series, but made the levels it did have flash by in a 45 second blur as you barrel down a hill towards the finish line. Downhill Jam still has fans to this day, but to this Tony Hawk fan, it's potentially the lowest point for a series that, to be honest, has a lot of worthy candidates for that dubious accolade. You can do all the basic skateboard maneuvers, flip the skateboard, push like you're skateboarding, you can grab the skateboard, turn the skateboard. Ooh, Tony Hawk ride, you're lucky you weren't a launch title. Should have stuck to hotel Back in 2006, when Nintendo launched its innovative motion-based console, the Nintendo Wii, we had only two questions. Question 1, what's up with that name? Question 2, no really, what's up with that name? We would like to play. The third question, when we got around to it, was will there be cool grown-up games on the Nintendo Wii beyond the wholesome first-party joy of Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess and Wii Sports? The answer was sort of, if you count Red Steel, which we don't because it sucked. Red Steel was ostensibly an action game that combined both shooting and swordplay in a high-octane crime drama. In actuality, Red Steel was a bad game that combined rubbish controls and terrible acting in a cringy Yakuza B movie. Thank you, Scott-san. Those damned Komoris. I thought we got rid of them a long time ago. The story goes that you are Scott, the former bodyguard and present fiancé of Miyu Sato. She turns out to be the daughter of a crime lord, and you turn out to be not a good bodyguard. Sato! What the hell? Hence your girlfriend gets kidnapped by gangsters, and you spend the game pursuing her abductors with all the Wiimote waggling you can muster. Scott? Oh, Scott! You! For the time has finally come! With the Wii Mote and Wii Nunchuck combo, you can shoot people or slice people, but not at the same time. For God's sake, be reasonable. Only the game can decide when it's time to use the awkward first person shooting controls and when it's time to use the awkward first person swording controls. Let this blade become an extension of your hand. The key thing is that both were as intuitive as a cookbook written in ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs. Red Steel was trying so painfully hard to make you a cool proto-John Wick action hero that you almost feel embarrassed on its behalf when, partway through a duel, you and your opponent get too close to a wall, so you both politely stop fighting and shuffle back to the centre of the room. Red Steel's cool factor couldn't even be salvaged by how the motion-sensitive Wiimote let you turn your gun sideways and shoot, which as we all know, is the coolest angle at which to shoot a gun. Yeah! The original Sony PlayStation, which launched in North America and Europe in 1995, was hugely exciting despite its lackluster launch lineup that included such instant non classics as Total Eclipse Turbo and whatever the hell a Battle Arena Toshinden was. I don't know, you tell me. Still no idea. Worst of the bunch, though, was Street Fighter Colon the movie Colon the Game, which was a bad game based on a bad movie based on a good game. Instead of the large, colourful sprites featured in the actual Street Fighter games, SF, TM, TG featured digitised actors Mortal Kombat style. And instead of fun, complex and rewarding gameplay, it featured jerky animations, game-breaking slowdown and awkward combat. Yeah, tell that to these controls, Ryu. 
Since this PS1 launch game was based on the Street Fighter movie, that meant all the game characters were depicted as their movie incarnations. Hence Cammy was Kylie Minogue, and Blanca was, I guess, some kind of half-orc clown. It also included exciting new stages for you to fight in, including a rat-infested hospital room and next to a van. How do they come up with these things? You've got to wonder why anyone thought this game was necessary. You do know there was already a Street Fighter 2 game out there, PlayStation. It's called Street Fighter 2. It was great, you should play it sometime. Some of you believe your system is the most advanced in the universe. Let's review the numbers. Sega Genesis is 16 bits. 3DO is 32 bits. The Atari Jaguar is 64 bits. Which is more advanced? Clifford! The 64-bit Atari Jaguar launched in 1993 and was vastly less impressive than the 32-bit Sony PlayStation and Sega Saturn that launched a year later, thus single-handedly killing off the tradition for using the number of bits a console has as shorthand for how powerful it was. Not even an optional CD-ROM drive that made the console look like Darth Vader's toilet could save it. I know, hard to believe. It didn't help that when the Atari Jaguar arrived on November 23rd, 1993, the launch lineup was a rather underwhelming two games. The one that came bundled with every console was a space shooter called Cybermorph. Good job the other game, Trevor McFur in the Crescent Galaxy, was also a space shooter. But don't worry, you'd only have to wait until December to do some more shooting in space in Raiden, or failing that until the following April for Tempest 2000, which, I mean, that looks a lot like a space shooter to me. Maybe someone high up at Atari was just terrified of alien invasion. Out of the two launch titles, it was Crescent Galaxy that was the worst offender though. The game was a side-scrolling shooter featuring pre-rendered 3D graphics and starring a humanoid actual Jaguar called Trevor McFur. Which is a bit like me being called Mike McSkin, just because skin is a thing I'm covered in. We're prepared to believe that the colourful pre-rendered graphics looked impressive for the time. What we're not prepared to believe is that you can blame the 1990s for the sluggish controls, tedious shooting and complete absence of any music whatsoever. It'd be a realistic depiction of the airless vacuum of space if it weren't for the awful sound effects. Endure an hour or so of tedious side-scrolling shooting and you'd come up against the final boss. What we can only assume are the faces of the game developers trapped in a transparent space prison, a bit like General Zod off of Superman. Presumably, they were imprisoned there for their many crimes. Well, one crime. Trevor McFur in the Crescent Galaxy. Hey, thanks for watching this video about the worst launch titles of all time that are best left forgotten. But what will be the worst launch title of the upcoming console generation? Why don't we all speculate now in the comments? What fun that'll be. And if you're looking for something more to watch, uh, then why not check out Show of the Week? It's on screen right now. Uh, it's a weekly live show we do on Wednesday afternoons where we get together, we talk about gaming news, what we've been playing, uh, we read your YouTube comments, it's a lot of fun. And also, uh, if you check out what's on screen right now, that is Outside Extra's Show of the Weekend. It's a similar kind of thing, but lots of games and art. Uh, arts, challenges, and lots of fun stuff. It's a really good way to spend uh, spend an hour or two with uh, your internet friends outside Xbox and outside Extra. So check that out, and we'll see you next time.